second session for our discussion of the incredibly moving and powerful book, Tattoos on the Heart. Everybody show it up. Woo! Who's got it nearby? You know. <laughs> um, this is by a Jesuit priest, Father Gregory Boyle, who started the largest gang rehabilitation and re-entry program in the world based out of LA, Homeboy Industries. Um, this is a story about economic opportunity. It's a story about the power of redemption and our common humanity and kinship. These are all themes we're going to talk about. These are themes near and dear to educators' hearts. Um, whether you work in a school or whether you are an educator more broadly, you um, are welcome here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to introduce you to this fabulous panel. Panelists, I'm going to ask you, please brag about yourself. Okay, just tell us what you do and what, what, what problems you love to solve, whether it's in your personal or your professional life. But also, thanks to Rajiv for the prompt. You know, we're ending the year. I'm just curious like what's something you're grateful for? So we'll just go clockwise. So Paula, you are to my right. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you. Hi everyone, um, Paula Hernandez. Um, I'm passionate about helping teachers well-being and support them in the mission that they do every day. I'm like so fortunate to be working with Jackie and actually everyone in this panel uh, towards this mission. And that's exactly what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for the community. I'm grateful for the guidance. I'm grateful to have amazing mentors and friends working towards this mission. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paula. Next up, we have my friend Rajiv. He's a global clients director. I'm bragging a little bit about you. But in this context, he is also the founder of this movement, Rajiv <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody, Rajiv Srivastian, uh, founder of 99 Pages, and uh, just honestly, when I think about this past year, uh, I'm just really grateful for all of our followers. Uh, 99 Pages was just started off as like this random idea I had just to try and read with friends. Uh, I love reading. I think it makes me a, a better, more patient man, a better citizen. And uh, I'm just really grateful for everyone who stepped up and started reading with us this year. I mean, some of our uh, following has really grown and I just am so grateful for everybody for just uh, taking some time to read 80,000 words of somebody else's worldview. It's the most intellectually uh, humble thing you can do. So thank you. Incredible. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Next up, I'd like to pass it on to one of my role models and heroes, Dr. David Bakun Lay. Go ahead and introduce yourself. There, you have too many titles. I don't even know how to even right. start to try to label you. I deal with this all the time. So I'm David Bakun Lay. Uh, I call myself a mercenary for change. Uh, I what makes my heart sing is is helping people gain clarity uh, to to better understand themselves and understand the world in which they live. So what I'm grateful for is, is clarity. Uh, I'm grateful for revelation. Uh, this year has revealed a lot to a lot of people. It's helped them to understand things that they didn't understand before. Uh, first and foremost, that makes my job easier, but I think it brings us closer to uh, a, a spiritual clarity, uh, an existential clarity that just will make our lives better. So I'm grateful for that this year. Incredible. Thank you so much for joining us. Next up, we have Doctora Natalie Mejia, who I only met due to the power of social community online. We share a common network, Teach for America Baltimore. I posted something, she responded, and now I try to get as much time with her as I can. So uh, Doctora, please tell us uh, what problems are you solving these days and what you're grateful for? And I'm unmuting you just so you know, I see. I want to make sure. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Doctora Nat Natalie Mejia, and I'm currently serving in schools, uh, which is a lot of my joy and spark um, throughout these last 10 years, really. And I'm really thankful to have been, to, to continue to be able to serve the families that I work with and the students. Um, it brings me a lot of joy to be able to pop into classrooms and see a learning happening, as well as seeing the joy on the teacher's faces to be able to be a part of that um, experience, right? I know there's been a lot happening since we shut down in March, but again, I, I take these little moments of joy, seeing them like be able to just see a science experiment live or this last couple of weeks we sent science kits, science kits home so it was a pleasure to see them just experiment and then the best part was getting text messages or text videos from parents saying like thank you for like continuing to provide this education for our kids during this time so that's been a bit of the joy and gratitude that i experience and have Yay, thank you so much for joining us um next up is a very important voice and rudy i want to brag about you a little bit 
educators often work in silos. You know, we are in our own classrooms, we are in our own schools, we are in our own little neighborhoods and zip codes. You need system level thinkers who can connect the dots and think about top down theory of change. In my life, Rudy is that. He is always helping me to connect the dot and think at a systems level. So Rudy, introduce yourself. Tell us what problems you're tackling and what you're grateful for today. Thanks so much, uh, Jackie, and also Rajiv for this opportunity. It's great to be back. Um, I'm tuning in from uh, Central Maryland, and so I'm grateful for our connection to um, all of you, uh, folks like David just down the road in Baltimore, as well as uh, those of you across the country in um, California. I grew up in the inner city of uh, Milwaukee, and uh, through education was able to become a, a first-gen college grad from Stanford and now finishing up my doctorate at Johns Hopkins. Uh, through my 20 years of experience in education and coaching, um, I now have the opportunity to help communities around the country to get better organized, like Jackie said, in terms of their systems for supporting young people to be successful as adults. Incredible. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just introduce myself. I'm working with everybody on this panel on community, whether it's a book club community, educator community, Edwell. Um, and so I have to say, like, what I am grateful for is community, but in particular in this year, the power of virtual community. I could never get this talent in a room in Baltimore with schedules and for better and for worse, everybody's stuck at home. And so everyone says yes to me these days because people are so generous. So thank you for this community of support, which is really special. And I, I think otherwise, again, it'd be hard to get all of you together. Um, so I am super grateful. Um, I'm also grateful for um, life. I um, am pregnant. I know also Rajiv's wife is pregnant. So very excited about some of the blessings this year that will uh, bear fruit next year. Is that creepy? That's weird. That was a weird thing. Um, <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and dig into the book. The English teacher in me is always like, let's get to the text. Let's get to the text. Um, this normally, and if you've joined us in the past, we sometimes will talk about a book chronologically. Um, but tonight we want to talk about the end in particular. It was Paula who messaged me to say how moved she was by this book, uh, in particularly the ending and throughout. Lots of stories, lots of crying, and to paraphrase my dear friend Paula. But um, Paula, I'm going to hand it to you. Um, if you want to share, start us at the um, end. What was so moving about the end of this book? Yeah, just to give a little bit of context. Um, so many stories, so beautiful, and, and they're all about redemption and trying to start a new life. Um, so the last one is the 16-year-old Chico to start a new job. He's trying to change things, and he um, he gets uh, a, gun, a gunshot, uh, and he dies. And at the end, um, after his death, the um, Boyle, the the main character, the author of the book, um, says to the mortician, "He was a terrific guy." And there is the, the this belief uh, from the mortician saying, "Really?" Um, and then Boyle ends the the book saying. And so the voices at the margins get heard and the circle of compassion widens. Souls feeling their worth, refusing to forget that we belong to each other. No bullet can pierce that. So it's truly that compassion and believing in each other and actually seeing the goodness in others, even if we don't know them, even if we have the assumption that they are monsters, a continuous theme throughout the book and how if we're compassionate with each other, if we really put ourselves in someone else's shoes, we can actually help someone get that redemption, get that new life that they're really, really looking to get. Thank you so much for starting us there, Paula. And you're referencing a quote um, that Rudy brought up last week, which was like 60 Minutes Big Wig came to do a show and was like, oh, I thought they'd be monsters. And it's like, golly. And I love actually that this book ends in a very honest way, like the Chico dying, not uplifting, the mortician's reaction, not uplifting. And it's a little bit of like, this is reality we live in. And yet, how might we? And so I'm curious, let's do the hard part. How might we, how might we make voices at the margins get heard? How might we widen the circle of compassion? Um, Dr. David, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this to you first. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, what uh, Father Boyle does very well throughout the book is present the stories uh, of the people with whom he works and those anecdotes, no matter how short or how small they may be in the book, are enough for you to 
to be exposed to who these people really are and really were, unfortunately, in some cases. And I appreciate the realism as well. One of the things that he emphasizes is it doesn't take much. Uh, we may look at some of the lives that were uh, discussed in the book and we say they didn't have enough time to, to be good, so to speak. Like they were just turning it around. They were just figuring it out. And then the, the light was snuffed out, so to speak. But he, what he emphasizes is, is that's all you need. You you are enough. I, don't, I, I, I didn't get through the entire book. I got through most of it. So I don't know if he ever said the words, you are enough. But that's definitely a message that I got as I've been reading it. it to, to him, one of the things he emphasizes, he told these young men and young women, you are enough. And, and a lot of times that's all it takes uh, for them to see who they are and who they can be. And then giving them the platform to, to tell their story. So I love the fact that when he did talks, he would take some with them. If he was getting an award and couldn't do it, he'd say, hey, you do it. That simple trust, you know, that that confidence in them to say, your story is worthy of being heard by all these big wigs and, you know, 40, 20 people. They need to hear what you have to say. That is such a powerful form of acknowledgement for people. And you saw how all the time they were clapping. Like, they want to hear from me. Oh, they're clapping for me. They're, they're applauding me. Yeah, because you matter. And, and and for them, that process started with Father Boyle saying, it's you they need to hear from, not me. He he knows what to say. He knows what to do. He's gotten all the accolades from top to bottom. That's why he's giving them away. So I I, I know that feel. I know that feel of getting things, but it's like, eh, you know, the, the for lack of a better word, the high has kind of gone away. Now you get a high from other people getting that experience of the accolades, the respect, the appreciation. So setting the platform to answer your question, Jackie, creating the platform and setting the platform for people to share their story, to reveal themselves to others as to who they are, who they truly are, not who we think they are, uh, is, is how we begin. And sometimes that's all we need to do is just let people tell us and tell themselves who they are. Incredible. And um, someone in our chat, Jessica Quindle, posed a question that was top of mind for me, which is, this is an educator book club. How do we how do we get educators to help young people believe I am enough? Um, and so I'm going to throw this tough one to uh, the person who's closest to students every day, Dr. Natalie Mejia, who's a dean at a charter school. Um, Natalie, talk about this in your own work. Yes. Um, great question, Jessica. And I think um, I'll share my thoughts and then I'll read a quote from the from the book. Um, I think it starts with what um, we, uh, Dr. David um, Funkley just named is like seeing people uh, for who they are and being in community with them and and knowing right off the bat that they are enough, uh, no matter how they come, no matter how they're dressed, no matter how they speak. Um, no matter like no matter what right like that's what compassion is is being able to see people for for who um for their true being and like the the joy and the and the good that they can bring to this earth right to our relationships to our moment in time and i think dr boy uh, sorry uh, father boyle named it on page 188 he said kinship not serving the other but being one with the other jesus was not a man for others he was one with them there is a world a difference in that and I think this relates again to educators and acknowledging that while we hold power as being a teacher or the administrator in the building, seeing kids and seeing families as one of us um, will allow us to move towards more equitable spaces because we're, we're leveraging the power so that there isn't a hierarchy in place and that we're seeing the full humanity in one another. Mm. Such a beautiful answer. Um, I uh, am actually, Paula, I'm gonna push this to you because we've talked about, we need humans to feel like they're enough. We need students to feel like they're enough. Um, Paula, you and I are talking to teachers, same with Natalie, and we have a comment here from Judy Bello in the chat, which is despite burnout risks, educators need to renew, rejuvenate, and grow their determination to see always the better angels within the students, the what if kids, I love that. And Judy, please elaborate in the chat about what you mean by the what if kids, because that's a, a beautiful thought. Um, but Paula, um, you know, you've worked with a lot of educators. You actively coach educators. There are many educators who don't feel like they're enough. And also, and if they're in a bad headspace, they might not extend the benefit of the doubt to a student who shows up late, doesn't turn in their homework, 
acts out. And so, um, Paula, how do we work with educators to make them feel that they are enough and rejuvenate them in order to do their great work with students every day? Oh, great, you're muted. One sec. Oh, can others hear Paula? No, I think I'm good now. Am I? You're great. <laughs> no, this is something that comes, I think, in every conversation and is really given the space of reflection. And going back to David and Dr. Natalie, uh, just asking them to talk about themselves a little bit and reflect what are the wins, right? What are the things that I've done in the past week, in the past month, in the past year that really makes sense and that they are meaningful? The moment that you ask someone who they are and what they've done and what is their mission and they start just saying it, oh, I worked with this kid yesterday. I worked with a student last week. Oh, I worked with a student three years ago. And now they're calling me and they're doing this and they're applying to college and they're doing this with their families. And just those moments of reflection of saying, oh, I've done all of this and this is how I'm impacting my students and this is how they're impacting my life. And this is how I'm creating community. Then it's a reflection of like, oh, I am enough. <laughs> I am actually working towards my mission. And what I keep thinking is how do we create those moments of reflection? Educators all day long, they're saying, oh, this kid didn't show up. This kid is not <laughs> turning on the camera. But they're not taking time to just pause, reflect, and celebrate who they are. Who they are. So if, there are, <laughs> if you have educators in your life, ask them, how are they doing? What is something amazing that happened that week? Let, help them remember their wins and celebrate with them. Thank you so much, Paula. There's so much happening in the chat. I love it that um, I'm actually just going to um, pass to you, Rajiv, because you said something that I thought was really great, which is about the word enough. And can you just bring that that conversation to here? What was your what was your comment? Yeah, you know, simply that the word when I think of the word enough, I think of sufficient. I think of like, you know, you've met the minimum. Mm. Uh, and to me, when I think of my childhood and you know, I by no, I don't want to by any means imply that I had a childhood like any of these characters in, in, in Father Boyle's book. But I feel like it was actually my parents who made me feel enough. But when I went to school, it was my teachers, the best teachers I had, they made me feel powerful. They made me feel elite. They made me feel I could take on the world. And um, they gave me the confidence to take chances, to do things, step out of my comfort zone and things like that. And um you know, my fear is simply that I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's semantics or not, but just uh, having people make me feel, you know, more than just enough, but feel like, like, hey, Rajiv, you can do whatever, you can be whatever you want to be. You just got to put your mind to it and work hard. Um, you know, hearing that, uh, I, I hope that's not semantic, you know, semantics differences, uh, difference in semantics, or, or just, or seems trivial. But for me, that sort of, mentality of excellence the mentality of like being elite um whether or not it's true in any frame of the word i think just like being told that hey you you know giving giving that sense of power uh to me was the greatest gift that any teacher ever gave me thank you so much um it takes a village it's like it's not there's not one source it's not just a parent family member teacher priest in a local parish that we all need to help the people in our life feel like enough, whether they're teachers or former gang members um, or uh, students, of course. Um, Rudy, I want to pass it to you um, for many reasons, but one, you did say something here about change the narrative um, and something you shared in the chat, I think should absolutely be shared live. But then I know we were also talking about the power of connection. So would you mind sharing kind of your thoughts about how to change the default narrative? And you're muted. I think you're good. There we go. Got it. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, yeah, I, I was sharing one example, which is um, a very recent story of a former gang member who was recently named as Missouri Teacher of the Year. And I think uh, we don't hear enough of those positive stories um, that can help change the uh, default narratives that we might see in you know typical um, news every day. And so I think it's important that we share our own stories. We share other stories. Um, I like that. And I think, um, you know, I mentioned my gratitude for connection earlier. Uh, one thing that kind of came to mind from 
you know, reading some of the book and, and hearing some of this uh, discussion around uh, connection and having someone who um, believes in you is just the fact that uh, it's important um, that each person also feels supported. Uh, a few years ago, Gallup did some really incredible uh, research um, that showed that uh, young people who felt that they had at least one adult um, in the school building that felt like that they felt uh, supported them and and believed in their future had a uh, were thirty times more likely to. Uh, be engaged in school than than students who did not um, agree with those statements. So I think that shows the power of that one connection. Um, and I think again, another example that came to mind in, in reading the book and thinking about how you know connection is an important uh, is important in in addressing some of these um, you know kind of gang issues, so to speak, is that um, there's a powerful TED talk I'll drop in the chat that talks about um, addiction and the challenges with addiction. And the uh, the key there is that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety; it's actually connection. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know we underestimate sometimes the power of our you know our individual potential to make a connection. Um, and I think for for young people, um, oftentimes with school being the safest place for them to be, um, those you know those words can be so powerful that they're hearing from teachers and, and other adults. So I think we need to keep that in mind in our work with them. Thank you so much. And again, um, we have great um, participants in the chat asking, how do we do this? Like truly big picture, this could book can provide inspiration, but takeaways for all of us in our life tomorrow, how do we do this? Jessica asked um, the concept of notice and wonder. How do we support educators in noticing each other, each student how, being present, which is really hard to do when you have 30 students and a million things going on. I got my dog pooping over there, like and maybe another partner's in this room. Maybe I have two kids on Zoom as well. It's really hard. So how do we support them? And um, uh, Doctora, I loved your answer here about gratitude. Would you mind just sharing kind of a way that you help uh, the, the team you support and in your own practice, notice each student um, and, and wonder how to support them? Sure. Yeah. So I wrote in the chat um, that one of the like most, I think, um, basic things that we can do is just take time to express gratitude. Um, and that's something that I'm currently doing with my students and my teachers is making sure that whoever you're spending time with on a daily basis, whether it's through coaching, whether it's through teaching, is that you just take the time to just say thank you. Thank you for for whatever they, they mean to you and whatever joy they bring to your life. And I think just taking note of that um, consistently will help you cultivate an asset-based mindset, which is what is needed in order for you to humanize, in order to empathize and, and have compassion for others. And again, it's a muscle that must be continuously cultivated because I think when people are in the state of like, they're feeling their own sadness or they're going through their own emotions, it's really hard to see posit like positivity um, but there are those moments, um, and even like in the pandemic, as we're experiencing where there is joy and there is um, good things happening, and we have to cultivate that and continue to to reflect on that and then express it so that it can continue to multiply. Um, and that people know that that's an expectation in the classroom, in the coaching conversation, or in the board meeting, like wherever you're at, it's just expressing that gratitude. Natalie, can I ask a follow up, if that's all right? So when we were doing a discussion earlier this year on like police brutality, right? Like we heard from police officers who said, you know, one, one second, I'm, you know, actually in a, in a kinetic fight. Like I have to be prepared to be, you know, on guard, but the next I have to be a therapist. The next I have to be, you know, sensing for drug violence. I have to be a social worker. It sounds very similar with the teacher. Like in many ways, I feel like we're almost asking so many skill sets of you know, if you're a junior high math teacher, for example, and you now have to be someone who can speak to addiction, speak to, you know, the enthusiasm and psychology of a kid and also be their, their psychiatrist, their therapist and help them feel, uh, feel powerful, feel sufficient enough, whatever word we want to choose. I mean, is this even realistic? Like, are we, is the real answer, hey, teachers need to be teachers and then we actually need to staff schools with experts in these other areas does, does that question make sense uh yes it does no I, am i okay yeah that's a great question and i think that's one that i get often and my response to that is teachers are responsible for creating an environment that produces uh learning right and um in order to cultivate that environment you want to make sure that it's one that kids enjoy being and also the teacher enjoys being in terms of serving in multiple roles, um, I cannot say that teachers don't serve multiple roles or wear many hats. I know because I've been in the classroom for many, many years, over a decade. 
Um, and I've done that, right? But I also want to tell my my fellow educators that there are people within your school sites that have those professional titles and that experience where you can, um, you know, call in people to support. And so lean on those systems and structures that are in place for for that particular uh, support to be take like to start. But I think again, like cultivating joy is something that teachers can own um, and can do little things, little daily acts that allow students to feel that love and experience, um, regardless of the circumstances that are happening outside of your classroom. Great. Does anybody, Paul, I saw you vigorously head nodding. Do you have more that you want to share on the multiple hats educators have to wear? Oh my God. Yes. Um, I was just doing an interview today with, um, with a um, school principal and I was talking about it well and like the needs and all the interviews that we've done and all the coaching sessions and how much teachers are caring. And he at some point said, so interesting that we need to create services like Ed Well to fix something that is broken and is not the educator's fault, right? We're putting almost too much weight on the individual. And it reminds me of Jackie and everyone in this panel has seen the image of the educator carrying that bag, right? with so many worries and so many responsibilities, um, which takes the educator to feel almost like in an island, like, oh my God, am I supposed to solve all of this? And what resources do I have? So I actually love, Natalie, what you're saying is this reminder of how do we create community? And there's so many people that maybe educators can tap into and say, hey, you know, like this is going on. Can you help me solve this? And it's almost like, why do we put that responsibility on educators? Let's help them. Let's help teachers create community. Let's help them connect with each other so they don't feel that they need to solve it um, on themselves. Incredible. Um, you bring up, a, well, I want to shout out this quote that I've highlighted. It's a beautiful, Yara Bell Rodriguez, thank you for adding it. I'm going to read it out loud. It's a paradigm shift. Now this kind of has to do with kind of changing the default narrative and how we see the marginalized. But she quotes, here is what we seek, a compassion that can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. Stand in awe versus in judgment. Just beautiful, beautiful. Yara Bell, thank you so much for contributing that. I wanna to speak to that in two ways. One, many teachers, particularly my demographic, white women, come into teaching with this saviorism and they see the neighborhoods and the communities and the students they serve with a deficit-based lens. And so I just wanna echo that, um, how do we teach educators, social workers, um, the mortician at the end of the book, <laughs> the 60 minutes anchor to stand in awe at, uh, at the incredible grit, um, resilience, uh, love, families, a uh, sense of brotherhood, sisterhood of these communities. Um, also though, putting on my coaching hat, I often wanna be a problem solver. And one thing I've had to practice in my own practice is how to listen because I don't need to have all the answers. In fact, I should truly believe that the person I'm working with, my collaborator, Paula, has the answers. And my job is really just to listen, to walk beside them and to ask good questions to help them uncover the answer because they are they are uh, creative, resourceful, and whole. Um, so I, I wanted to to share that, Rudy. This is a total aside, but you um, are active here, and you have this awesome YouTube handle called the Rudy Effect. And I'm curious, as we think about helping others see their worth and empowering others, can you tell us? I know this might be a total side thing about the Rudy Effect. I know you're someone who's passionate about many things, so I'm just I'm just gonna put you on the spot to tell us. I appreciate that. There's definitely definitely a connection there. Um, so I'll I'll take the opportunity for the plug. Um, before I do though, I wanted to also share a, a concrete practice um, that I actually learned from um, kind of a shared mentor between myself and one of our um, um, participants via the chat, Jessica uh, Quindell. So um, there's a woman named Linda Treadway who's done some amazing work um, nationally on preparing principals and and others. And one of the concrete ways that she addresses what was just discussed. Um, is at the beginning of the school year in particular, actually going out into the community with the educators and identifying all the different assets within the community and thinking about what are all the different ways that um, the, the families um, have assets and things that they can do to, um, to be supportive with the, with the education of the students. Um, and so kind of gets ahead of the deficit thinking. And I think that that's a really practical um, approach that I wanted to share. Um, in terms of the Rudy effect, um, 
I have my little explainer video hasn't come out yet, so I appreciate the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to plug it. There's a couple aspects to it, but a lot of it is just having to do with essentially um, helping others see the, the potential in themselves. Um, the Rudy effect is actually uh, a term that Hopkins researchers came up with for the impact of the work that I did in Baltimore City around getting uh, young people to um, to pursue higher education um, at a greater degree and kind of turn around a trend that was um, in the city before uh, I moved into the city. And so really it's about, uh, it's about collective impact in helping basically not only individuals see their potential, but helping um, collectives see the, their collective potential when they work together. And so um, really just uh, putting together some resources to make sure that uh, I can help people understand like how the brain works and then how we as networks uh, can work together more effectively. Um, incredible. David, I want to, Dr. David, I love it. I want to come back to you to say, um, you work with so many different stakeholders. You work, you walk in so many spaces. You advise so many different groups. This idea of like asset mapping, helping white women like me better understand the communities in which they serve, especially if they're not from the communities they serve. I'm just curious if there's anything that you want to weigh in here that we've been discussing. Uh, I love the fact mm -hmm. that we are, are focusing on the assets and not the deficits, because that's the one thing that I really identified. Anytime we look at a problem, we look at the problem. We, we don't look at what aspects of the solution exist. A lot of the challenges that we see in, in public health, any type of, of development, any type of fixing things is we operate as if the answer cannot possibly exist as is. And, and that's a challenge. And usually what that does is that completely divorces us from the people that we are serving. We, we talk about the importance of connection that being the opposite of addiction or in a lot of things connection is is the opposite of so many of the maladies that we deal with in society one of the quickest ways that you can build that connection and one of the ways that you can make your job easier as a problem solver is to ask what do you think and we don't do it enough so we, we we need to realize that sometimes the answer lies before us or sometimes the process by which we get to the answer lies before us. So I, I'm glad that, and I'm not surprised with this group, um, that the focus is on, okay, what are the, the assets? What are the resources? What are the benefits that already exist in the spaces that we are, are so grateful and so blessed to occupy? How can the people, um, with whom we you know with whom we not just associate but with whom we are and, and we talk about the, the the book so you know so much with uh father boyle and, and when he references christ uh which he does a lot he, he he really emphasizes the humanity of christ you know this was god in flesh and this god in flesh was not divorced of humanity jesus was human just like us so I, and, and was the people, he was not of the people, he was the people. So I, I, I think if we go forth with our genuine desire to do right by our fellow humans, knowing that the best way by which we can do right by our fellow humans is to be in concert with our fellow humans in the solutions that we craft, then we're doing it right. It'll be a holistic solution and it'll be a sustainable solution if the people that we are charged to serve ourselves are part of the process by which we get the solution. Rajiv, I saw you. Yeah, I'm not sure what the mark is for a question. I'm gonna make one up for I got I got a follow-up question for you. Like in your experience, uh, doctor, what are some of the assets? that go overlooked in these communities? Like what are the things that you see most of these kids overlooking that they're not seeing that you're like, hey, you got this asset, man. You got to focus on that. Like what are some of those things that people overlook? I don't know if it's not, I don't know if it's necessarily that they overlook, they just, it's they don't see it that way. Uh, so you think about the places that kids hang out a lot. You know, it could be the random spot in the neighborhood, but all the kids are there. So it, it's a, it's a touch point. It's a, it's a place of fellowship. So you ask them, like, do you realize how important this place is? Do you realize, you know, how it's a place where people gather? You can get people together. It's like, no, it's just the place we hang out. So it, it's, <laughs> it's just semantics. Yeah, so, yeah. So a lot of times it's, it's a reorientation, not necessarily for you 
uh, as the observer, for, but for them, it's it's what they know. So a lot, uh, a lot of the the challenges that people deal with are what they know. So they know nothing else. It, it it is their normal. But at the same time, those assets and resources are also their normal. You know, you can go to a lot of spots in in, in Baltimore City, and kids got a place to go. They, they there's a place that they'll congregate. There's a place that they can go for some semblance of resources. They just don't look at it that way. So a lot of times it's about first reorienting them to what is an asset because how many how many times do they they even hear the word asset or think of this is beneficial this is actually helpful or healthy and then the the onus is on not just uh us but them to strengthen that that healthiness that exists in this place so for for me half the battle uh, is just orienting people to say this is a good thing <laughs> Yeah, you know, it may not be as as good as you would, and, and I dealt I dealt with this during my postdoc. Half the battle for me with my process was telling people, look at what exists right now, because people get nostalgic too. Like we we are we are notoriously nostalgic with things that we assume were better back then, just because it was back then. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's it's looking at the now, so mindfulness. We call that mindfulness, and, and then looking at uh, again something that is ultimately beneficial something that is ultimately good for you good for your health it may not be everything you want it to be but it's something and i think that's something too we operate in absolutes a lot so if it's not perfect it's not it's nothing you know what i mean yeah it's, you have to be start with what is and be grateful for that acknowledge that it's something and know that you can build upon it from there so like if we put ourselves in the shoes of like Cesar or some some of these characters that have been involved in these gangs uh, or in, or in bad let's just call them bad, generally like bad circles where they actually view that as an asset. So I'm curious. So simultaneously, you almost have to ask them like, what are those like benefits that you have in your life? But also like, what ha you know if they identify, let's say those those bad friends that are involved in some bad activities, if they view them as their connection, their community, their platform, like it's almost like it's a two edge, it's a two step process. Not only do they have to acknowledge like what the assets are, but they also have to think about what they think their assets are like they currently and in, in sort of change their perspectives. Like, actually this is doing you more harm than good. It's, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it seems like it's, it's a, it's a pretty complicated thing to do actually. Cause people will hit And you're right. People will look for, let me put it this way. At the end of the day, I, I say that there are five things that we as human beings want. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be appreciated. We want to be respected, we want to be understood, and we want to be loved. And we'll look for it wherever we can. And I can guarantee you that many of them homeboys and homegirls, when they found them gangs, they found acknowledgement, they found appreciation, they found respect, they found understanding, and they found love. Now, it may not be to the objective levels that would be, would be best for them, but to a person, they would say they got all five of those things by joining a gang. So I, I think for Father Boyle, what he did was to show that you can get those same five things in a much healthier way. And a lot of them figured that out, whether they figured it out at the very end or they were able to live a long, healthy life with this reorientation. They were able to find another path to get those same five things. But they but ultimately, no matter what, they wanted those same five things. That's the story of so many people in gangs today. They're looking for those five things and they'll get it one way or another. Whether it's by any metric healthy, that's up for debate. But you can't say they didn't get what they were looking for. That's brilliant. I love those five things. <laughs> that's you're awesome. me, yeah, sorry. No, you just got, you're just making me think about recurring theme that I, we also see with teachers. and. I want to ask the panel how we see this with kids and how do we create the space. Um, a thing that we've seen in a lot is how do I bring my voice and how do I bring my whole self to where I live, to my school, right? And Dr. David, what you were saying, I mean, maybe reflect like, 
these kids were able to bring their home selves and their voices right to their gangs and they got that recognition and belonging and the uh, father Boyle actually said hey you can also bring your whole self outside of that environment to a more healthy environment so how i guess going back to education for teachers for kids right and for everyone how do we create spaces in the classroom outside of the classroom in your community for people to bring themselves fully to the table and i'll say as a latina sometimes i struggle with that i talk to teachers that are latinas that are queer and they struggle with that so what how is our responsibility to create those spaces mm. a couple of things that um come to my mind along those lines as well um going to david's point around how sometimes um young people can kind of take for granted some of the assets that they have and, and don't necessarily realize that they're potentially assets um, for example, bilingualism is such a huge asset, um, and oftentimes, even in schools, it's kind of treated um, or addressed as if it's a deficit, uh, which is so backwards and, and disempowering when it could be um, really empowering. Um, another example that um, I'm hoping Jackie would be willing to share a little bit about in terms of Rajiv's question about how do we um, kind of build on those assets is thinking about the work of dent education. So Jackie, if you don't mind sharing a bit about that, I think that's really relevant to this. Yeah. So um, with the team, I am part of, um, I'm a co-founder of Dent. It believes that every student has creative potential within them to make a dent on the world around them. Funny founder, we're all social entrepreneurs in this group. Um, funny founder story, we asked people, you know, we're thinking about naming our organization Dent and people are like, God, that sounds so negative. <laughs> like I dent my car. That is my greatest association with them. And on one hand, we didn't take their feedback, um, dent, but the, the people that got it were like, yeah, like it's not an easy road and you get beat up along the way. Maybe you do get dented, but then you find your dent, your hammer, your tool, your impact, your voice, your story, your poetry, your music. Um, this book has a lot of beautiful language around shine your light and poetry. And some of it is in the chat and I'd love to come back to it. So dent is all about find your dent. That could be a podcast. That could be a, um, a, a product you build a business around as a path to economic mobility that serves your community and maybe gives your family a little extra income. Um, it, uh, it could be uh, your graphic design work that helps mobilize change and draw attention to food deserts in Baltimore. Um, so, so thank you, Rudy. Um, I'm very proud um, that I am a denter myself. It means that I now see problems as opportunities to innovate, but the system begins with asking questions to challenge the status quo and truly listening first, not like imposing my worldview or ideas, but truly listening to different people at the table in order to co-create <laughs> some kind of dent, uh, which Paula and I are doing right now without having any of the answers. That's why we we pull in advisors. Um, is, Rudy, is that is that what you wanted? <laughs> I think the layer I would add to it, just for everybody's clear understanding as well, is just that rather than seeing the entrepreneurial spirit and hustle of Baltimore youth as a deficit and a threat, Dent turns it around and empowers them to economic self-empowerment um, and to be able to be entrepreneurs, which I think is brilliant. I totally missed that. And I have to share an anecdote. My friend rents her home on Airbnb in Baltimore. She got a negative review. It's like, uh, there were drug dealers on the corner. And she was like, you mean my neighbors? Like... It's just, it reminds me of like the mortician at the end. You, it's like she knew, it's like her neighbors that hang out at the corner and that's the source of community for them. Um, that made me really frustrated. Um, Natalie, I, I wanna, uh, Doctor, I wanna, I wanna pass it on to you. Um, we talk about the, seeing the assets. You have posted a lot in here about shining a light. I'm just curious if, if you wanna weigh in on this question. Yes, I, I mean, I appreciate what everything, everything that's being shared here. And I, th I, I didn't know about that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's an interesting name to choose. Um, but I also agree with what you're saying. And I think the book highlights this, right? Is like, as everyone was speaking, I think what comes to my mind is that it's the heart work, right? Like, it's not like the work that needs to happen uh, to cultivate anything is like the individual, the individual person who you are really needs to be in a space of like reflection, appreciation, understanding, um, compassion, empathy, right? Whatever word or action verb you want to put onto it, like 
people need to start within themselves first. And I think that part of that work is accepting you for who you are and the joy and like all that you bring to this world, both the good and the ugly, right? Um, that makes us who we are as people. And I think when you can resonate with your own power, you can see the power in other people. And one of the quotes that has always stayed by me and I truly love to like, like value to this day is when I used to work in um, the prisons in Jessup, I remember I served as an educator, as a, as a teacher um, or a math, math instructor. And I remember one day, one of the, uh, the police officers stopped me in the, in the jail. I was on my way to the education building. And so I was in there and he said, you know, um, the, like, they really like you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. It's like, I'm a female, I'm in a male's prison. He's like, no, like, they really like you. Like, they really enjoy going to your class. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'm sure they feel that way about all of the educators that come this way, right? Just like, I was trying to say, like, they just have gratitude for the program. He's like, no, it's because you see them. You see mm -hmm. them beyond their conviction. And I think that has always, I mean, I know that's always stayed with me. And even now, as I connect with my students who are all older than me, right? I was like 21, 22 at the time. And they were, um, most of them were double my age. Like they reached out and said, like, thank you for seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. And one of the most powerful stories is I remember one of my students went into isolation um, or sol solitary confinement is what they call it. And somehow, some way, he still managed to get the final to me. And I was just like, wow, like the power of like education, right? And he wrote in a note, he goes, it's the power of you believing in me. And that was something that I was like, I, like it's just always stayed with me because I saw them for who they are and not their convictions. I saw them for what they bring to my classroom, our classroom, and not what like society has labeled them, whether whatever gang they were in or whatever experiences they've had when they were in our class, like that space was ours. And I saw them as people. That is incredible. Rudy, did I, was there anybody else wanted to add in? Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just quickly add. Um, so I, I went to a Quaker school for, for middle and high school. So we had to do uh, their form of church, which is called meeting for worship. And uh, the thing about Quakers is they're, they're very simple. So the meeting house is simple. It's a, it's a small, quaint space, nothing on the walls. And the service is basically you sit in silence. And w within the Quaker uh, faith, you just kind of wait for that revelation from God. Uh, the one thing that I remember the most from my time at Friends, uh, so the Friends School of Baltimore, was there is that of God in everyone. Mm. That is like the core philosophy of Quakerism. There is that of God in everyone. And, and for me, as I've gotten older and, and really structured my faith, you know, based on on my experience, I've I've molded that that phrase that 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 philosophy to there's that of love in everyone, and I think all that we need to do as as human beings, be it educators, mentors, guides, prophets, whatever you want to call it, is to help people see the love within themselves, and to remind them how they exude love in everything that they do. When you talk about that that revelation for people, that kind of seeing the light, that example of, of, of that one, that's it. They saw the love in themselves. It was revealed to them. And look how it completely transformed their life. Something that simple. That's why I, as, as, as complicated and as complex of, as the issues are that we deal with, and they, and they truly are, I feel like so many of our solutions are that simple. That's where we have to start with the solution. Every single act we take, be it again, uh, a behavioral change, uh, a culture change, a policy change, just needs to start with the acknowledgement of humanity and the acknowledgement of love in every person. And look what can happen when we do that, when we simply just acknowledge the love in a person. It's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff and, 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 it's, and it's, we talk about solutions, right? That is right before us. And there's nothing that we are more equipped to do as human beings than to acknowledge the humanity in our fellow human beings. That doesn't require a degree. That doesn't require any type of program. You ain't got to go to Hopkins or Yale or Baltimore City Community College to find that. All you have to do is what? Be. Incredible. I want to um, bring in a couple just examples um, from the book um, that make this hard, actually. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remove the, there we go. And I want to see Rudy's face. Um, so we have to see the love 
and we want to see the love in ourselves and help others realize it. But there's a quote, I didn't write down the page number. Society drills the notion of unworthiness into the minds of the marginalized and poor until they accept it. How do we break that cycle? So one, on those who are marginalized. Also, I just wanna say for those who lose patients who don't spread that joy and love, the gladness that we haven't got to talk about, but one of our chapters is about gladness. There is a story about um, how Father Boyle had the church, church harbor 100 homeless immigrants and parishioners were complaining about the smell because like it impacted their life. He also opened up the church to gang members and they were like, I don't want them in the bell tower, you know, these bad people. Um, and so one, society has drilled it into those who are mar marginalized and also us normal people, sometimes not normal people, but I'm lucky to be in mainstream and not marginalized because I'm white. Um, and I grew up in a, maybe a very traditional upper middle class home. Like sometimes we forget to see, uh, you know, the, the smell of the parishioners. I just think of that, the smell of the, the homeless immigrants an, an, annoying the, the parishioners. I'm just, I'm just curious, everybody. I know we keep coming to this, but how do you change hearts and minds? Rajiv, this is a tough question. I'm going to put it on you in a totally analogous way. You work in sales. Your job is to persuade people. Not anymore. You manage those people. But um, like, how do we change hearts and minds, both of the people who don't think they're worthy and of the people who overlook their worthiness? Yeah, I mean, this is the, uh, the quintessential question of our national identity right now, I believe. I think that uh, this is where um, we are failing as a nation. Uh, and, and I mean that sincerely. I think that um, I think empathy is a two way street, right? Whether you're marginalized or not, I mean, it, I think that's literally the first step for everyone. Is we've got to be able to look at the other side and see the world from their view. Um, honest to honest to goodness, sometimes I ask myself, I wonder what is easier to extract out of our American privileged class? Is it easier to extract their dollars or their hearts and minds? And honestly, I'm not sure, right? Because on one end, like, uh, you know, and, and I, I work in, you know, corporate America, I work with a lot of these folks that are skeptical. I would, you know, happen to know plenty of Trump voters and you know, hyper conservative people that do not understand what Black Lives Matter protesters are talking about, right? Like I, I absolutely interact with them. And it's not that they're bad people. It's not that they don't, uh, it's not that they don't have hearts, right? It's to me, what I hear from them is simply just a lack of, of exposure uh, to be completely honest, it's like first and foremost, a lack of exposure. We do not, we have a very uh, segregated, we have a heterogeneously designed society where we don't always intermingle with each other, right? Uh, in, in many parts of the country. Um, honestly, it's to, to win those hearts and minds, it's, it's gonna take a lot of compassion. It's gonna take our own, like it, it's this dichotomy, right? Because I understand the anger and the impatience. And when I, you know, see the protest myself, like I get it, you, you know, I, and it doesn't help anyone to, to hear, oh, well, we've come a long way, right? That's that the absolutely worst thing you could tell someone who's got a social justice uh, gap in their heart, right? It's like, oh, we've got like, I wasn't alive back then. I'm not going to be alive later. I want to fix this now because I want equality now. I totally understand that. Um, but I think what I think it, it, it is the sales pitch to the powerful in society to make structural changes is not going to be made with anger, right? It's going to be made by telling deep, open-hearted stories about not just the problems. I think that's another thing we focus on a lot is like the problems that are there. But I think what's really important is for us to actually come up with practical, coherent, and I hate to say the word pithy, but actual solutions that are, you know, just, just wins, easy layup wins, piece by piece. Um, and I know that's not satisfying. I know it's not, uh, you know, the, the big change and the big uh, thing that we all want to have. But um, I really do believe that the, the fight is won slowly but surely. It, we're going to win way more bees with honey than vinegar. And uh, it's about being deliberate, quantitative, and very specific about the asks. And it's something that I think I 
personally have started to gravitate to. Like when I hear a social justice cause, um, when it is a uh, when it is a compelling story that has a you know very deliberate ask and maybe even quantifiable evidence behind it, the answer is yes to everyone, right? It's very rare that those kinds of uh, you know those kinds of arguments don't work. I think the problem is. Uh, something that I think a lot of this, you know, social justice movements face is that their 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 arguments are really powerful for people who already agree with you, right? And those aren't the people who need any convincing. So I think as we go in our in our various journeys, as we depart this call, I think uh, if there's one lesson I could impart in for my you know limited career in sales, is that let's really you know the goal is not to express uh, your emotions and your uh, view of the world. The goal is to win. Uh, to, the goal is to win the the end state, right? Uh, and I think to really keep that as the end goal, and just be very deliberate about the storyline that you're telling, and the deliberate of what the ask you are making. Uh, I think that level of focus is something that uh, is one of the reasons why we haven't seen very much progress. Is I just simply don't see a focused narrative um in you know in a lot of these arguments and uh yeah anyways that's just kind of my perception just for my i'm a professional storyteller and i just think we could be doing better thank you i quoted you in the chat but i thought that um a sales pitch to structural change is not going to be made with anger it's going to be made with stories powerful i'm curious though does anybody disagree with anything rajiv said about ways to make change about maybe the power of anger um uh, about how some people do want to demand it now, even though, sure, maybe we have to compromise that it's going to take time. I'm just curious. Is it, I want to make create space in case anybody disagrees. There are a lot of people who disagree with that. Let's be honest. I could, I could, I could go ahead and give myself the counter argument because I think about this all the time, right? The other art argument is like, I don't want to be nice. I don't want to be like being nice and being compassionate and being empathy to someone who doesn't demonstrate empathy to me and who isn't coming to my table to show me empathy, why does that person deserve my heart and my story and my like openness to hear what it must be like to be a poor, uh, you know, extremely wealthy Bay Area sales guy who pays 13% in California taxes. Oh, poor, poor Rajiv. You know, like no one cares about that guy. Why should I, you know, uh, be uh, given the, the heart and soul and empathy and why should someone have to like who's suffering have to have the skill set of a salesperson to improve their life, right? That's the counter argument is that is just not a realistic skill set for people who are fighting this fight. Uh, and so, yeah, it's something I think it's, it's, it's something I, I argue in my head all the time about it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a legit, it's a legit argument. It's a legit yeah. argument. And while I, I think there is an answer, I, I understand and appreciate the argument. Uh, I'll be honest, black people talk about this all the time. Yeah. You know, why do we, why, why why do we need to convince our oppressor? <laughs> I know. This, this is this is you know and, and this is and this is why you got so many of the splits that you got particularly in the civil rights movement. You know, you had your Martin Luther King Jr who was on on one side of an approach. You had Malcolm X who was on another side of approach, but then you had uh, a Huey Newton the Black Panthers. You know who were even more militant you know with that same notion is like why am i going to be nice and all to my oppressor when they're they've shown no semblance of recognizing my humanity why should i do the same and i struggle with it too because i have my days you know? <laughs> i'll bet you do man <laughs> on my nerves not gonna lie to you um what i come back to all the time is is that there is that of god in everyone hmm. There is that of love in everyone. And just because they aren't at the point where they are in tune with their love doesn't mean you need to sacrifice yours and how attuned you are to your love. And you may be the only, you may be the only example of love they ever see in their lives. And why would you ever want to squander that opportunity? It, it love works. It, it, it does. And, 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 you know, you can look at the Beatitudes, you can look at how we have written about love, you know, throughout the ages. But love works. 
And, and love is a beautiful mess. I think all of us who have been in love know this. <laughs> beautiful mess, but it's still beautiful. And if we are guided by that principle that love works, it will work. Mm. Let's, we're going to close there. Everybody, a little snaps. Thank you for some amazing contributions, both of the panelists on video as well as the very active chat room. Um, I want to echo something Dr. David shared earlier, which is may we acknowledge, appreciate, respect, understand, and love each other. And um, as we end 2020, let's think about um, that quote from Mother Teresa um, about how we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Just as Father Boyle says at the very end, let's refuse to forget that we belong to each other. Let's uh, make room for voices at the margins and let's widen the circle of compassion. Good night, everybody. Thank you for uh, getting me through this year. Um, thank you for the power of books and empathy. 80,000 words, Rajiv, just like you've started with this mission. Um, it helps give me a better perspective. I love spending my Wednesday evenings with you.